implementation of urban redevelopment projects in Detroit proves the social and cultural significance of urban renewal nationally because many blacks were disposed from their homes and forced to leave. In this short film, I will recount the details of the Gratio redevelopment project in Detroit in order to shed light on the effects racism had on the redevelopment and blight of Detroit and America as a whole. This little known history of urban planning is relevant today because it has displaced many black Americans and still affects their lives to this day. At the beginning of the 20th century, Detroit was a leader of transportation. Known worldwide as the Motor City, Detroit was attracting many people of various backgrounds to come work in their factories. The importance of the car in Detroit greatly affected the way cities were being rebuilt and the people that were coming and going. This ideology of post-war planning greatly affected the city of Detroit and its people living there. The houses in the Gratio area were very run down and barely even livable. Many houses had very bad living conditions, including defective toilets, no toilets, dangerous coal stoves, filth, brazen rats, roaches, bed bugs, crawling on all chairs, other insects whose names aren't sure of. By 1950, many of the lots within the Gratio area had these conditions within them or were left vacant. The expanded size of the black ghetto in the immediate post-war period meant depopulation of the oldest and poorest sections. One of these sections included the famed strip of businesses along Hastings Street in the Gratio neighborhood. On May 18, 1948, U.S. Representative George G. Sadowski stated that condemnation awards paid for slum properties in the path of expressways go to the absentee landlords. The tenant families that are evicted are simply left standing on the sidewalk with no place to go and no funds with which to provide themselves with shelter. In the face of a severe housing shortage, any municipal government that ignored the plight of these evicted families would be morally bankrupt. The Gratio Area Redevelopment Project was one of the city's most controversial urban renewal projects of all time. As the state's first and largest urban renewal project, the development encapsulated for Detroit in the hope of many in the city that mostly African-American slums could forever be expunged through redevelopment, replacing unsightly downtown neighborhoods with new, attractive, modern housing. The Gratio Project was designated UR MISH 11 by state officials which was originally conceived as a part of a comprehensive housing and urban renewal plan from the Detroit Plan of 1946. This document was being constructed during the majority of the 1940s. This plan designated 12 different locations specifically for the development of public housing. The redevelopment of what would later be known as a Gratio Area Project was first reported by the Michigan Chronicle on November 30, 1946, in a fourth-page story titled Hastings Gratio Sun Clearance Announced. The site was left vacant for 10 years, but eventually was redeveloped by the architect Nice Van de Roe. During the 1950 census, the Gratio Area Redevelopment Project area was 95.7% non-white. This same census counted 1,238 dwelling units, 120 which were owner-occupied, and the average rental price for these units was $29.17. Meanwhile, in 1960, the census tracts were redrawn to include the Lafayette Project in one contagious tract and was 90% white. The new population of this area was also quite wealthy. 58.7% of the total population earned over $10,000 on a yearly basis. Most of the new residents also had some form of educational degree to their name. The medium number of years of school completed in the area were 16, which was close to double the median of any other area within the city, and double the median of the same area from 1950. This goes to show that city policies played a large role in displacing people of color while also cutting down the number of dwelling units by half. This was not the intended goal of the Detroit Plan. The Detroit Plan had intended to renew the city's most run-down and dilapidated neighborhoods and construct new housing within the area. The city would do this by using eminent domain and construct public housing in its place. Construction was supposed to start in 1947, but due to legal challenges, the government could not obtain the land. The land was eventually sold to a private developer in 1948 by rule of the Michigan Supreme Court. 
But it wasn't until 1964, 18 years after planning began, that Mayor Jerome P. Cavanaugh released the final report for the redevelopment project. This project called for the demolition of entire neighborhoods to make way for an interconnected freeway system, which confined black Detroit residents to certain areas of the city. There were a lot of protesting done by all forms of groups during this time of blight. White neighborhood groups did not want public housing to be built in outlying neighborhoods, and black communities hoped the city would construct public housing on vacant land to alleviate the shortage. This is when voting and attending city council meetings had a large impact on the state of development and where certain groups would be placed. The white neighborhood associations would attend and speak at various city government meetings and councils. In 1941, The Chronicle, a Detroit newspaper, had a story titled, Housing Project Foes Stage Uproar in Council. Approximately 400 people came to a city council meeting to protest that they heard there would be a Negro housing project in the area of the Eight Mile Conant on the city's northeast side. Even though Housing Commissioner James Inglis declared it was merely propaganda that the housing would be mixed, he was shut down by the crowd, who would not let him be heard. The story went on to speculate that this was just the beginning of the effort to block all and any forms of public housing within Detroit. In the 1949 mayoral election, George Edwards, a liberal Democrat and Common Council president, made a strong case for public housing as part of his campaign. Edwards' plan was to construct over 12,000 units of public housing with the government's estimated $130 million budget based on the federal government's 1949 Housing Act. Edwards received a lot of support from the city's unions and many important leaders within the black community. Whereas Edwards' competition, Albert Cobo, had an opposite position and implementation plan. The Cobo plan would call for private construction of public housing and result in taxes being doubled. Cobo ended up winning the election, campaigning on the promise that he would stop what understood to be Negro housing projects. It can be assumed that Cobo won because of his stance on public housing and received a majority of votes from whites who opposed public housing. New Mayor Cobo and the Housing Director Secretary James H. Inglis did not see eye to eye when it came to new developments in public housing. When tasked with implementing the City Plans Commission's urban renewal goals, they had varying opinions on what should be done about the public housing situation. In the Plans Commission's notes, it describes both positions that were taken at the forum. Mayor-elect Cobo and Housing Director Secretary Inglis differed sharply in their proposed solution to the housing problem. The mayor-elect favoring using federal funds for slum clearance and turning most of the cleared land over to private developers, with minimum of public housing, while Mr. Inglis favored making maxim maximum use of federal funds for low-rent public housing in order to relieve the housing shortage and make possible a more extensive slum clearance program by easing relocation problems. Later, on December 20th, Inglis resigned from his position as Housing Director Secretary due to the disagreements between Mayor Cobo and himself. Inglis did not believe in the plans that Cobo had wanted to implement into the city of Detroit. Shortly after Inglis's resignation, Cobo replaced Inglis with Detroit builder Harry J. Durbin, who would be the new director of the Housing Commission. In order to further move along with his plans, Cobo replaced many city officials with builders and realtors that would go along with his plans of slum clearance. Historian Thomas Segrew even stated that the roster of housing officials in Detroit in the Cobo years reads like a who's who of the city's real estate and construction industries. Cobo wanted to enact his slum clearance plans as quickly as possible with the relevant department heads and representatives. The Michigan Chronicle wrote that Detroit has never witnessed such a ruthless extermination of the opposition as the present administration has used in getting rid of people who oppose the administration's position on public housing. In December of 1949, Cobo announced his official housing policy, which stated, we all recognize that there will always be honest, sincere families who cannot meet the rental charges required by private ownership, but it is my belief that the participation of city government should be limited to the needs of these families. 
it will not be the purpose of the administration to scatter public housing projects throughout the city just because funds may be forthcoming from the federal government. I will not approve federal housing projects in the outlying single home areas. Overall, the displacement of blacks in the Gratio area was unjust and racially motivated. The project cleared 129 acres, including the Black Bottom and Paradise Valley areas, displacing mostly black families. Detroit's Urban League even declared that no single governmental activity has done more to disperse, disorganize, and discourage neighborhood cohesion than has urban redevelopment. After experiencing this displacement, many black Detroiters started to call the process of urban renewal Negro removal and started to organize against it. This brought many groups and organizations to come together to fight against this renewal. One of these groups was Goal, a group on advanced leadership, which demanded that no black churches be torn down, the displaced residents and businesses be given financial compensation, and for hospitals to commit to ending racial discrimination when hiring. Thanks to many similar groups as this one, urban renewal in current years has more laws and sanctions on certain actions. After examining the past, it is important for developers to look into the future and learn from mistakes that were made in the past. Gratio is again in the process of being redeveloped. In 2019, city leaders and residents came together to create a plan for the neighborhoods near Gratio and Seven Mile in Northeast Detroit. This project was supported by the Strategic Neighborhood Fund. This plan looked at stabilizing single-family neighborhoods, multifamily housing, and retail opportunities, as well as park, greenway, and streetscape improvements. The planning activities concluded in 2021 and are looking to be implemented sometime in the near future.